quantum materials have been changing the world for decades thanks to their extraordinary properties. I should be used to it by now, but today's topic totally freaked me out when I first heard about it. Here's the story. Some researchers from Stanford University left a strange device on the roof of their building. It didn't have a battery, and it wasn't plugged into any power source. That noon, it was cool outside. The thermometer was at around 17 degrees, but the sun was beating down from a cloudless sky. The aluminum on windows with full exposure reached nearly 40 degrees, and the black paint on the wall registered a blistering 80 degrees. Want to know what temperature the rooftop device reached? Around 12 degrees, five degrees lower than ambient air temperature. With no refrigeration, the device had cooled itself in the blazing noonday sun. How can that be? Part of the trick lay in its reflective top surface. A large portion of the light rebounded, wasn't absorbed, and didn't heat up the gadget. But for it to become colder than the air around it, what sort of magic is this? The secret is that the material makes clever use of a very old law of physics. Planck's Law of Blackbody Radiation. We already have a video on the Spanish channel that explains the origin of this law, but in a nutshell, it says that everybody glows at a certain temperature. We're made of charged particles, which, when they move, agitate the electromagnetic field around them, creating radiation. The strength of that agitation, in other words, the body's temperature, determines the type of radiation emitted. The sun at 6,000 degrees mainly emits visible light, particularly green light. We, at 36 degrees, give off waves verging on the infrared spectrum, and even an object at just a few degrees above absolute zero radiates microwaves. Light tells you which colors will radiate from the body and how intense they'll be. That's Planck's law. And it has the status of a law, in part, because its derivation is immaculate. Except for one small loophole that condensed matter physicists are taking advantage of. Look, when an electromagnetic wave is generated inside an object and wants to get out, it has to contend with the interphase between the material and the air. If this wave travels more or less perpendicular to the surface, it will escape without a problem and will detect it as radiation. But if its path is oblique enough, we encounter a phenomenon known as total internal reflection. The wave bounces off the interphase as if it were a mirror, and we don't see it. You may have experienced this phenomenon from the bottom of a pool. Now, nothing in nature is 100% abrupt. You can't go from having light passing through media to nothing at all. Nature is definitely not a fan of true discontinuity, and numbers confirm this. If you do the math, you'll find that there is an electromagnetic wave passing from one medium to another. This is an evanescent wave, a fitting name because it doesn't go very far. In just a few microns, it fades and vanishes. And that's why, in practice, these waves have no impact on our lives. It's also why tons of theoretical derivations like Planck's law omit them. But what would happen if we put two surfaces really close together with only a nanometric gap between them? Then the conditions for the evanescent wave change. Instead of petering out in the void, it penetrates the other material and continues to travel normally. In other words, now it's not just waves hitting at the right angle that will be able to radiate outwards. The ones that bounce off the surface also contribute. Therefore, the energy transfer between the two surfaces is much greater than what Planck's law dictates. And this increased intensity isn't the only way physicists have managed to break the law. After all, the radiation a body emits comes from its vibrating charges, and depending on the structure of the material, certain vibration frequencies will take precedence over others. So by creating a material with the right kind of network, you can modify what Planck's law predicts practically any way you want. Harnessing this principle is precisely how the rooftop device managed to get so cool. You see, the air around us is very sensitive to certain infrared waves. These electromagnetic waves have just enough energy to make its molecules vibrate and spin. In other words, when a body tries to lose energy by radiating infrared waves at ambient air temperature, that energy is quickly absorbed by nearby molecules, heating the surrounding air, and consequently the original source. It's like trying to get rid of a ball and having it partially bounce back to you. But if you could radiate on a frequency other than these infrared waves, using one that doesn't activate surrounding air molecules, the radiation would escape. 
That's exactly what the Stanford team did. By creating a custom material with different layers, they switched its radiation to the portion of the spectrum where air doesn't absorb, using it as a free cooling system. Reflectance plus this passive refrigeration explains how this system can get colder in the sun. However, this is nothing new on our planet. Saharan silver ants have been using a similar technique on their skin for hundreds of thousands of years. Tiny hairs with triangular cross sections help reflect a large amount of sunlight while also letting them cool off by radiating waves in this part of the spectrum. As contradictory as it might sound, those hairs keep the ants about 5 degrees cooler than they should be. And as you may have guessed, people are already looking for ways to put these two techniques to practical use, for instance, on solar panels. A big problem with solar cells, which transform light into electricity, is that they're only sensitive to a few specific frequencies, just like the air molecules. That's quantum physics for you. So when the sun hits the panel, only a fraction of all that light is actually being used. But if we could create a system of two materials that first absorbed all the sunlight and then emitted the received energy on the frequency to which the cell is sensitive, we could significantly boost its efficiency. With these new techniques, placing the materials very close together so that evanescent waves can transfer a lot of energy and creating custom materials to boost the frequency we want, that dream is already a reality. We already have successful prototypes that are 40 times more powerful than traditional cells, although the problem of how to manufacture them industrially has yet to be solved. Even so, I think it's mind-blowing. It's insane to think that a brainy question like, how might we break Planck's law, inspired technology that could be decisive in the fight against climate change. That's one of the rewards of supporting more theoretical science. You never know what it will come up with. Speaking of which, researchers like the pros at IFIMAC are studying the potential applications of Planck's now flexible law with things like infrared transparent visible opaque fabric, which could be used to make ultra cool garments, or fine tuning those heat transfers to create circuits, logic gates, and even memories using only heat flux. No one knows where all these crazy ideas will lead, but I can guarantee you'll see them here on the Quantum Fracture. And remember, if you want more science, just hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.